What's up, everyone? It's Cody with MoneyVest. So in this video, we are going to talk about both Amazon and Enphase. I thought I'd do one video kind of going over both companies. So we're going to take a look at the earnings for them. And towards the midpoint of this video, then I'm going to switch over to, again, Enphase. We're going to start with Amazon, then we'll talk about Enphase. Uh, of course, Amazon here rallying a little bit over 6% on the day and Enphase here dropping over 15% on the day. So we've got lots to unpack in this video. Make sure that you drop a like. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're just joining us uh, for the first time and link to our Discord and Patreon is going to be down below if you're interested and joining there is a 16 annual discount that's available till the end of this month and uh you'll get access to all the members only private videos and all the updates and analysis on discord and not to mention the trading view charts and the uh spreadsheets and of course the uh, stock reports as well so links are going to be down below and we'd love to have you on board so first things first let's talk a little bit about amazon amazon came in with very strong beats beat on eps 94 cents per share now this also does include the rivian gain which we are going to go over and 58 cents per share was expected uh revenue came in at just over 143 billion dollars in just one quarter quarter uh, versus 144 billion expected and Amazon Web Services coming in at just over $23.1 billion. Uh, and that's uh, just slightly below expectations of 23.2. And advertising obviously coming in very strong at over $12 billion from the company as well. They said that the fourth quarter sales are going to be somewhere between $160 and $167 billion. Analysts were expecting $166.6. So kind of in line with guidance. And uh, if you take the mid guidance of about $163.5 billion, that's going to represent about a 9.6% growth on a year over year basis compared to $149 billion same time last year. So, you know, very strong, you know, I would say it's a strong growth relative to the size and scale of Amazon. I mean, it's not easy growing from hundreds of billions of dollars and not to mention the higher interest rate environment that we're in. So these numbers definitely do suggest the core business continues to be very strong and revenue did jump over 13%. Uh, in the third quarter. And Amazon has been very clear in the cost cutting mode for the past year as it became clear that it expanded too quickly during the pandemic and the company has laid off 27,000 employees since last fall as well. Andy Jassy said in a statement, and I quote, we had a strong third quarter as our cost to serve and speed of delivery in our stores business took another step forward and our AWS growth continued to stabilize our advertising revenue grew robustly, which obviously a little over $12 billion is a big number. And overall operating income and free cash flow also rose significantly as well. And sales in Amazon's core e-commerce business continue to recover, expanding 7% year-over-year after 4% growth in the previous quarter um, as well. And net income more than tripled, 9.9, .9, almost $10 billion, or 94 cents per share from $2.9 billion. And net income for the quarter includes a pre-tax valuation gain of $1.2 billion from the company's investment in the electric car maker Rivian as well. So this right here is the operating income, up a 343% year-over-year which again includes that, you know, operating income, uh, sort of like that gain on the Rivian investment. This is going to be net income just coming in at under $9.9 .9 billion, up 244%. Very nice trend over the last three quarters and 2023, as I mentioned, I think the profitability is going to be the main driver for Amazon moving forward. That's one of the main reasons why I am looking again, buying more Amazon or investing in Amazon because advertising AWS is got lots of potential because that's going to be increasing the margins and the profitability for the business as well over the long term. And that's, uh, that's basically the whole thesis behind Amazon. Uh, when it comes to trailing 12 months, net income just over $20 billion. You can see that, you know, Q3 2023 net income includes a pre-tax valuation loss of $1.4 billion, including a non- operating income expense from the common stock investment Rivian Automotive compared to the pre-tax valuation gain of $1.4 billion from the investment in the trailing 12 months, third quarter 2022 as well. So they are making those adjustments. And uh, and, and without even, without, even without that, I think the profitability is now starting to kick in with Amazon uh, Web Services and advertising. Advertising is very, very strong here. And it's kind of starting to take market share away, I think, from YouTube and from Meta as well. Uh, segment results, AWS was up 12% year over year to a little bit over $23 billion in the third quarter and operating income up 29% to almost $7 billion per share, uh, $7 billion overall. So if you do the math, seven divided by 23, we're looking at a 30% operating margin for AWS. Uh, now, if you switch over to, let's just quickly go over Amazon's chart, then we'll switch over to Enphase because I've got lots to talk about on Enphase. This right here, up a little bit over 6%. So it's kind of bouncing off of its uh, 200 simple moving average. So if I remove everything, you'll notice that it came down to that 200 to $117. And then of course, bouncing back higher up to almost 7%. Very nice move back up to $127. But I would still highlight that we are very much in the context of a downtrend still. So again, we talked about this in our previous updates. So if, you, if I come over to Amazon, uh, you'll notice that we are still very much in the context of this lower high and lower low pattern. So in other words, a downtrend that's still following up with, uh, with the overall chart at the moment. The price action, in other words, resistance is going to stay put roughly around 133, 134. Support level is going to stay put at $123. 
Okay, so that's Amazon. And again, my fair value is still going to be intact at a little bit under $100 uh, per share. Again, those are just, you know, very good reference points and intrinsic values where you can look at. And I personally use them uh, as an estimate, right, based on future expected uh, revenue growth, earnings growth, and then discounting them back to present value to better understand, and of course, applying a margin of safety with accounting the share dilution to better understand what's going to be that intrinsic value or fair value for that business. Now, of course, you know, stocks almost never trade at fair values, right? Sometimes they are overvalued, sometimes they're undervalued, and that's what makes the market, right? If the markets are efficient, and that's one of the things that I think beginner investors need to understand, is that these fair values are not the set in stone values that every stock needs to be trading at, right? If that were the case, the markets would basically be flat, right? Forever. There would not be any inefficiencies to take advantage of, right? The fact that the markets are inefficient in a way that stocks are trading either overvalued or undervalued levels is the reason why markets function the way they do, right? Because there are inefficiencies to take advantage of because most of the times markets are not trading at their fair value. They're either overvalued or undervalued. And that's where the inefficiencies come from. Now, moving over to Enphase. Now, I've got to admit a one blind spot with Enphase that I had was not being able to anticipate how severely the interest rate hikes are going to hurt the future demand for the company. Okay, that is something that I was I, I already knew and I mentioned this in our Discord and I'll go over that. I've got lots to discuss for Enphase in this video. Uh, so I mentioned this on October 19 that I'm getting a little bit of a bad feeling with um, with with Enphase and you know with Tesla and Nvidia and all those companies because of the higher interest rates. Um, and and October 19th, if you come back, right, Enphase was still in the $120 levels. The next day, right, one day later, Solar Edge comes out with their earnings, uh, preliminary earnings, and kind of guiding terribly for the future. And the stock drops heavily. And then Enphase kind of reaffirms that guidance yesterday, uh, you know, slowing down with a significant reduction in the fourth quarter revenues of 300 to 350 million dollars. Now look. As I just said earlier that, you know, most of the time stocks are not trading at their fair values. They're either overvalued or undervalued. Uh, I want to be very clear uh, on our analysis and our relationship with Enphase, right? Especially my relationship with Enphase. It's not been all about, you know, buying and, you know, long-term thesis is strong. But in fact, if you go back at least one year, right? If you go back to December 2022, literally less than a one year ago, uh, this is something that I, you know, mentioned in the Trade Ideas channel. This was a short trade idea on Enphase, right? Enphase makes, makes for a great short trade from both fundamental and technical standpoint. Uh, and the reasonings were that it's trading at a very high valuation at over 70 to 120 times price to earnings and rising wedge patterns also forming with a breakdown that could send the stock down at the $235 level. You know, a few days go by and this is kind of funny if you go back December 28th to 2022, less than a year ago, uh, basically mentioned let the Enphase downfall begin. And who knew that it would, the downfall would continue from $235 all the way down to where it is now at just over 80 bucks. But the, the reason why I wanted, I wanted to bring this up is because the analysis is done from a valuation standpoint, right? And look, I have blind spots and I have weak spots. Everyone does. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and work on it so that we can continue to become better and better investors over time. And I'm going to go over exactly what that is. I've already mentioned it. It was the lack of understanding of how higher interest rates could affect the future demand for the company. And I mentioned this, but I did not take action on it. And I'll go over that in just a minute as well. Now, this right here is October 19. Just, just what I was referring to, right? I basically mentioned, this is from this year, by the way. So just about eight days ago, mentioned that I'm not getting a good feeling about the market divergence with yields. It continues to ignore the fact that treasuries are hitting their highest levels in over a decade. And the reason why Tesla, Enphase, and NVIDIA could significantly struggle in this environment because three reasons. Number one, these companies have never experienced borrowing costs as high as it is, right? So think about it. Auto loans, you know, just personal financing loans, the solar system, you know, financing loans have never been at seven, eight, nine percent. Uh, so, you know, that can be a problem for a lot of these uh, tech companies that are dependent on that discretionary spend and financing. Not to mention the flight to quality risk is tremendous in this market. And finally, I'm looking to once again, increase my cash exposure and only step back in when the VIX is over 30. So I did trim a little bit of Tesla. Little did I know I should have been looking at trimming end phase as well, because like I said, uh, the, the shortcoming was the higher interest rates affecting the guidance from the company, which obviously got affected um, from a future standpoint, right? The demand's tapering off. Um, and now we're, now we're looking at, you know, significantly low, like 50% decline year over year in the fourth quarter. Now, if you take a look at the numbers, right? So revenue came in at just over 551 million dollars, which was lower from 634 same time last year for Enphase. Um, gross margins still expanded, right? So 47 and percent. And I'll go over the great, the good, the bad, and the ugly in this video for Enphase towards the end. I'll talk about all of those things and operating expenses at $144 million. 
And uh, that, again, increased a little bit from 132. Operating income was down from 135 to 117 million. And net income was slightly down, marginally down from 114 to 113.9 billion dollars in the third quarter as well. And diluted earnings per share, 80 cents, which was basically flat on a year over year basis for the company. Now, this is where the damage happened, right? Revenue guidance to be between 300 and 350 million dollars. And the CEO, Badri, also mentioned that majority of that slowdown is coming because of higher interest rates rates in the US. And that's what he mentioned in the earnings call, which I mentioned in the Discord as well, uh, is one of the reasons which, again, we, we knew, we anticipated, uh, but, you know, didn't, didn't kind of figure out, okay, how severe could that really be? And that means undershipments, 80 to 100 megawatt hours of IQ batteries, and that's, you know, 50% reduction in deliveries uh, and revenues year over year. Now, this right here is going to be the nine months ending. So, you know, here's the thing, right? A lot of us get fixated, and I think that's what Wall Street also does. It gets fixated on the short-term prospects of the company, and the third quarter, obviously, very brutal, and fourth quarter guidance, also very terrible for the company. But if you take a look at on a year-over-year -year basis, right, net income, um, basically net revenues, 1.9, almost $2 billion uh, versus 1.6, right? So that is still a increase on a year-over-year -year basis. And once you account for the guidance, which they have mentioned 300, 350 million, you know, that's going to be roughly $2.3 billion, and last year, they also did $2.3 billion. So this right here is the net revenues from last year, 2.3. So we're really looking for a flat year, right? We're looking for a year which is going to be flat in revenues, right? It's going to be just about the same. There's no growth. There's no declines. And, you know, given how high the interest rates are, that may not be the most terrible thing, right? Uh, and again, it's there's a silver lining here, and I may be looking at the more optimistic scenario, but uh, I'll go over the again the great, the good, and the bad, and the ugly, which is going to help you better understand where we stand with this company. But 2.3 billion versus 2.3 billion from this year, it's basically going to be flat. 974 million dollars in gross profit and net income. If you take a look, the bottom line, just a little bit under 400 million dollars. And look at the net income right now. Like, this is what is interesting. Like, net income already has surpassed last year's net income, right? So the margins have expanded. The margins have gotten better for end phase and 418 million versus 397, right? So 418 divided by 397, that's a 5% growth and we still have one more quarter to go, right? This is, this is what's interesting because we're looking at the entire year 2022 net income of $400 million and EPS of about 277. If you compare that to the first nine months, we're already at an EPS of 292 and net income $418 million, right? So profitability is up on a year-over-year -year basis given the macro challenges and the higher interest rates. Now, look, I understand this may be coming across as, you know, caddy, you're stupid because <laughs> the stock's down, right? And that's what happens in the short term. Price action dictates everything. I can I can sit here, talk about fundamentals all day long. It's not going to matter. It's not going to mean anything because the price action speaks volumes, right? And price action says we're down 12%. So the analysis is complete BS. But that's what I want to help you understand is that this is not a short trade. This is more of a long term long term, right? Renewable energy and the solar transition, if and when that happens. And the biggest challenge that Enphase faces right now is the interest rates, which they also mentioned in their earnings. Uh, but the business itself, like you look at the numbers and the numbers don't lie. The business itself uh, expanded, you know, on a net income profitability basis. Let's take a look at gross profit. Nine months, $911 million. Uh, gross profit from last year, the entire year, 974. So chances are revenue is going to be flat, but margins expanding, right? Margins expanding. So gross profits up year over year. Operating income might also be up year over year. So income from operations, looking at $448 million. Um, and this year so far, we're already at 456. So, there we go. I mean, operating income's already up in the first nine months compared to all of last year. Gross profits almost the same as the as all of last year. We still have one more quarter, and net income is already higher than all of last year, and we still have one more quarter to go. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, those are some things I think we need to kind of understand. And and you know, there's it's all about. I know it's always compared against the analyst expectations and consensus, and you know, it was a mess, and the guidance was terrible. 
But numbers don't lie. And look, if the energy transition and the renewable energy space is going to accelerate and look, the revenue forecast is still at almost $9 billion by 2032, even if it's not $9 billion, let's say it's, it's $6, 7000000000 billion over the next you know three to four years, five years, uh, margin expansion is going to get profitability to higher levels. And that's going to mean better comps next year. So it's possible that Enphase does report very strong numbers next year if the revenue grows and margins expand and profitability is up. So so those are some things to keep in mind. And now I'm going to share some of the posts that I wanted to go over. So uh, like like I said, I mean, there's good and there's bad, right? So the bad is that you, I did not anticipate how severe the higher interest rates uh, are going to affect the company's demand and the slowdown. Uh, but the good is that it's still a fantastically run business. Like the numbers show that. And I know there's going to be some disagreements in the comments, and that's totally fine because I think that's normal. Uh, but if you just take a look at the numbers, if you just take take the time to look at the numbers, you will see the profits are up, net income's up on a year-over-year -year basis, diluted earnings per share is up year-over-year. -year. So it's not like we're looking at bad companies. It's not like we're looking at a terrible company. Enphase is not a terrible company, right? It's just going through a very, very challenging environment uh, where interest rates are affecting the guidance. But even then, even despite all of that, they're still able to grow on a year-over-year -year basis. I think that should receive some credit. So I basically mentioned that in regards to Enphase, my blind spot was not anticipating how severe the slowdown would be for the demand. Given the higher interest rates, this is from the CEO from the earnings call last night, and he concluded this say, uh, by saying that they are managing through a slowdown in the overall demand. In the US, it's due to higher interest rates. That's the problem. Um, and again, this is me going over again, October 19, I had a little bit of an iffy feeling that, you know, high interest rates are going to affect the company. Uh, October 20th, Solar Edge comes out with their preliminary guidance and of course takes the entire solar market down. Uh, so in terms of what I'm doing, just sitting tight until further notice on interest rates uh, and Federal Reserve policy, because look, if interest rates stay higher for longer, it's possible that Enphase also goes through this flatlined revenue for some time. Uh, and if revenues don't grow and expenses, you know, are somewhat higher, it's possible that margins compress in 2024. So I think it's 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 it is unfortunately dependent on the macro environment. So this is the good, this is the great, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? The great is that Enphase is still a fantastically run business with excellent products, tech innovation advantage, and higher margins compared to competitors, and it's only growing. We just looked at the numbers, right? The good is the solar and renewable energy transition is still happening as the world becomes more dependent on solar and green energy. The bad, higher interest rates and macro challenges are hurting Enphase's demand as nobody wants to finance the whole solar system at 7 to 8% right now. And the ugly part is... Enphase has no control over this, right? This is not something that Enphase can fix overnight like Meta last year when they were spending a lot of money on the metaverse and all they needed to do was like cut expenses and the stock rallied, right? Unfortunately, Enphase can't do anything about the interest rate situation that we're in at the moment. So so last thing I wanted to add is that, you know, if Enphase can come out of this with, a, with this higher interest rate environment, which I do believe that they will, right? The numbers do show that. Uh, you better believe that their growth will be insane over the next 10 year span when rates are lower, if rates are lower, right? That's the big if, and green energy transition accelerates. So, so that's something to keep in mind for this company. Of course, it's getting hammered, valuations down, and everything that I just set up until this point will sound like a lot of BS. But look, I'm, I'm going over the fundamentals. I'm looking at high quality companies. I'm looking at companies that have consistent track record of growing revenues, earnings, profitability. And here's going to be my message for you is that literally like on this channel, it's our mission. It's our goal to look at companies that are growing revenues, earnings and profitability and have strong balance sheets. If you don't find that here, then then you know, you, you will not find companies that don't have that. And I'm not going to go over those companies, right? Um, now, price action and sentiment can change and it will change and it will make my fundamental analysis completely irrelevant in the short term. It will, right? I'm here to tell you that price action and sentiment can indeed might make my fundamental analysis irrelevant in the short term. But it's really the long term is what I'm focused on over the next five years, 10 years. Can these numbers continue to grow, right? That's the real question that we need to ask ourselves. And if you believe that it can, then I think, you know, end phase today um, at 90 bucks or 80 bucks trades at a attractive valuation, but it d does still face some of those issues, macro challenges, which is which it has no control over. So that's all I wanted to go over. And, you know, I do still think there was a weak spot on my end because I did not anticipate with the higher interest rates how it could affect the future guidance. And knowing Wall Street and how short-term focused it is, if the near-term guidance is poor, we're going to have a day like today. So hope you guys enjoyed this video, found it helpful. If you did, make sure you drop a like, subscribe to the channel. Link to our Discord Patreon is going to be down below. 16% annual discount. As always, happy investing. I'll see you all in the next video.